Okay, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Sharaf Day. He'll be presenting on mixed effects random forests. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for having me. Uh, I'll dive right in. You know, um, so uh, my name's Sharaf. You know, I work at Manifold. I'm a founder and the CTO there. We're um, AI consulting firm out of the Bay Area, uh, offices in Boston as well. Mixed effects random forest actually came up in some of our client work when we ended up open sourcing some of the work uh, as a package. And I wanted to kind of talk about uh, the, the package and like why it's useful when it's useful really. Um, so kind of five sections to my talk. But really, before I begin, let me ask you guys, how many people have heard of mixed effects, random, or mixed effects models in general? Okay, how many people have, have used them, implemented them? Okay, less, less, less. Um, how many people have never heard of mixed effects models? Okay, it's a good amount. So, okay, this first part won't be totally um, useless. Uh, so, let me talk about what motivating mixed effects models. When is that useful? They are useful for clustered data, as Morpheus is saying here. And I'll tell you what I mean by clustered in a second, but this sort of data is all around us. And it comes up often in um, you know, machine learning modeling problems. So I'm going to use a classic data set called the Minnesota Radon data set. This is the, what, what the data set looks like is um, you have about ni 900 samples. Uh, what you have is you have the log radon level in your home, uh, in homes. Uh, you have what floor it's on, zero denoting it's in the basement, one denoting it's on the first floor. And then in addition, you have what county that sample was taken in. And so the idea is I want to make a model that predicts what the, um, the radon level in, in the basement or on the first floor will be. So that's what I want to do. This added complexity is that there's this, this county, uh, which is, you know, could be useful. Uh, the problem, though, is that, you know, how do I, how do I put that in the model? Uh, and the other big thing I'm going to explain here is that the amount of samples per county is wildly varying. So some counties have very, very few samples. Other counties have many, many more examples. Anoka County has 52 examples. So the question is, how do I make a model to predict the log radon? And so this is where mixed effects models are useful. And so if you think about it from first principles, there's really a few ways you can attack this problem. First one is, you know what? Let me just ignore the fact that there's a county. Let me build one global model. This is called the complete pooling model. Another alternative is on the opposite end of the spectrum, which is, you know what, let me just make a single model per county. Let me not try to make a global model. Um, another thing you can do is you can think, uh, let me just one hot encode the cluster. The, in, in this case, the cluster is the county. Let me one hot encode that and put that in the model. And then what, what I'll motivate here is like where classical mixed effects models uh, is useful. So let's go through each of these in turn. So complete pooling. What, is, what do I mean by this? I mean, let me throw all the data in a single model. So in this case, a single linear model, and let me learn, you know, if it's a zero input or a one input, what will the output be? And so what I'm showing you here is eight um, example counties that I've sampled from, from the data set. There's actually 84 counties. Um, some counties, like Lac Couperl County, has only two samples. St. Louis County has many, many, many examples. What I have learned, I'm showing as this blue line. And so this is a single linear model. As you can see, all the models in all the counties look the same because I've learned a single model irrespective of county. This is complete pooling, a global model. This is fine, but the drawback here is I can't learn any idiosyncrasies about that county. So perhaps St. Louis County is in a particular part of the state that has particularly high uranium content in the soil, so the radon levels are just like naturally high or something like that. I can't encode for that. In addition, as you can see, when I don't have very much data, you know, like maybe this is real, maybe this line should be up higher, but since St. Louis County and other counties that have much more data, this is pulling the model for this um, county much lower. And so this is the problem, and kind of like the picture that I want you to have in your mind is that I'm going to learn a single set of parameters irrespective of cluster, no matter what cluster I'm in. So let's look at the alternative now. Let me learn a separate model per county. So I'm going to shard my data. So I'm going to take, learn a linear model for Lac Couperl County, and you know, since there's two points, the line goes through the two points, and so on and so forth. As you can see, what's starting to happen is since I'm sharding the data, in places where I don't have very much data, 
I am like learning models that may be nonsensical. You know, I am overfitting. I am not learning something that is relevant. You know, and it's particularly like even Ramsey County, notice that the radon level is going up as you go higher on the first floor versus the basement, which is typically, that, that is usually not the case. There is a very strong prior that radon levels are higher in the basement. So that's the problem with doing no pooling. So when you shard the data and you learn an independent parameter per cluster, the, the models can become very, very noisy. So both have their drawbacks. Now, there's this alternative thing I can think of doing is let me one hot encode the cluster. So in this problem, 84 element one hot encoding vector, technically 83, and then I put it into the model and, and, and see what happens. The problem with this, say you use a tree-based model like a random forest or a gradient boosted tree, if you have high cardinality categorical variables, the tree will get lost. And you know that you can read um, some some good um, references about that. But essentially, the, because of the way the splitting works in the tree, the 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 it, it just gets lost when you like make really really um, long one hot encoding vectors. And so there's drawbacks there. And it, it, in addition, even if you could one hot encode it, it doesn't scale. You know, even um, in the best case in packages like H two O and R, which do this appropriately. But by the way, Scikit-Learn does not, other than the binary. Uh, categorical variables, scikit-learn can't take in high Cardinelli categorical variables directly. It doesn't actually do the random forest splitting appropriately. Um, but even packages that do, uh, you can only do it about to about 50 before computationally it becomes infeasible. It, it grows exponentially. That's why the, the splitting decision. So drawbacks to that as well, this is where classical mixed effects came from. So this really motivates it. So what I really want to do is I would love to have the ability to learn an idiosyncratic model per cluster, per county, but I want to somehow regularize that across all the counties. So I want to use all the data, but allow little bit like twiddles for each of the separate counties. And this is what the classical mixed effects modeling does. Um, the way, you know, I'm not going to get into the hardcore math about it, but what's happening actually is that you can learn an independent parameter per uh, county, per cluster, but they are regularized using some prior that is learned across all of the counties. And so the global thing comes in as these things are called hyper priors. And so these parameters must be drawn from a Gaussian distribution that has mean, mu, uh, standard deviation, sigma. And therefore, as you can see, what happens now is that this thing, since there's only two data points, I'm much closer to the average um, model. This, um, uh, this one over here and this one over here, since I have so many data points, I'm learning an idiosyncratic mean and, a, uh, and sorry, an intercept and a slope. And so this kind of generalizes in a much better way. And this is the linear, uh, nonlinear mixed effects modeling, this is what it's all about. And this is very, very powerful technique um, and can be used on more problems than you think. If you think about, this is like clustering by county. If you think of educational data, you cluster naturally by student, by teacher, by school, by school system. Healthcare data clusters often, you know, by patient, by um, attending physician, by hospital system. There's a lot of different ways you can cluster and you can hierarchically cluster this. You know, uh, so another name for mixed effects modeling is called hierarchical Bayesian clustering. So, okay, great. There's still drawbacks. The biggest drawback of classical mixed effects modeling is that you have to specify the functional form of your model. And so I, I call this, you got to know the physics of your model. So whether it be linear or something nonlinear, so this is some, um, uh, it's a functional form for, I think, chemical dynamics. You know, there's learnable parameters, but I've had to specify the functional form because I understand the physics of the problem. And, you know, this is great, but the beauty of modern machine learning, you know, random forest, gradient boosting trees, deep learning, is that I don't have to specify the functional form, and the algorithm itself is a universal function approximator and can learn some weird nonlinearities by itself. So I would love to have the best of both worlds, that's where the mixed effects random forest fits in. It is a model um, where I can have, um, I can learn a nonlinear part, and um, right now, the way it stands, the algorithm has a linear correction to the nonlinear part that is modeling the mixed effects, the, 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 uh, the random effects part of it, you know, to use some of the terminology from this literature. And so I'll get into how this all works, but this is really to just motivate it.
So how does it work? Um, First, some history. You know, this algorithm, I'm not going to take credit for coming up with this. This actually came out of uh, HEC Montreal, the statistics department there. Uh, Professor Alam and Professor LaRoque, uh, you know, wrote like a series of papers in 2014, 2015 about this technique. We, you know, found it, wanted to implement it on some of our client projects, did it, and then eventually got permission from our clients uh, to open source this as a package. And so really our contribution, we wrote this open source MRF Python package. Uh, and actually what was nice though is we got a lot of help from Professor Alam and LaRoque. We reached out to them. They you know, were very uh, forthcoming, shared their you know, like kind of rough R code, you know, helped us debug the algorithm. So just a little life lesson. The Python community, the, the machine learning SAS community, everybody is very, very open and like wants to share. So when in doubt, reach out. People will help, it's great. So let me talk about the model a little bit. So what we're gonna do in the mixed effects um, random forest um, is I wanna model my response variable y as a, as a random forest f that has to be learned, which is a function of my features. In addition, for each cluster, so i is the cluster index, so in kind of the Minnesota example, it's the county. Um, for each cluster, I'm gonna have a linear correction, and z is another feature vector. And so terminology here, this is called the fixed effects covariates. These are called the random effects covariates. This is terminology from the mixed effects modeling world. Our, um, what we wanna do now is um, we wanna learn f, bi, and then the hyper priors, you know, sigma bi and sigma e from the data. I'm not gonna get into the deep details of how this is done, because hopefully this is all magically hidden away from you by the, by the Python package. But long story, like short story is um, the way you train this is using uh, a class of algorithms called expectation maximization algorithms. It's essentially a form of iterative optimization. I fix F and then train for B, and then I fix B and train F, and back and forth and back and forth. In fact, there's three steps. I, I fix B and I train F, I fix F, then I train B, and then I uh, estimate sigma B and sigma E from the data. There's a lot of math under the hood that looks scary and hard. Um, but in fact, if you kind of, you know, defocus your eyes a little bit, the math actually ends up looking a lot like the common filter because that's actually what's happening. It's very related. It's, um, you know, it's, it's Gaussian. It's like I'm doing co stuff with covariances and inverses and stuff like that. You know, funny story also from implementing this package. This was from the paper. We implemented it, double checked it, and it just like was always diverging. The iterations would just diverge and diverge. And I was like, this is when I reached out to Professor Alam and LaRoque. I was like, what is going on? And then I was actually comparing it against the Kalman filter math. I was like, I think there's an inverse missing here. And then when I got their code, I saw, lo and behold, there was an inverse. The published paper actually had an error in it. And that when, I, when I worked with them, they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, that should be an inverse. I was like, OK, thank you. So like, it was like a good um, sanity check. But you know, if you go detailed enough, you can find errors in published papers. It's fun. <laughs> but um, anyways, not going to go into the details too much. But what happens at prediction time? So now I have an F, I have a BI, I have a set of BIs, uh, and I have the sigma BIs. At prediction times, there's in fact actually two different types of predictions, like two classes of predictions. There's prediction for what are called known clusters. So these are clusters that I saw in the training data. For those, I pass X through the random forest, I take Z and I multiply by BI and I get my Y hat. But there could be what are called new clusters. So for example, in the Minnesota set, say some counties I just had no training data for. I still want to make a prediction for that data. In that case, I just use the random forest part. I don't apply the linear correction. So it supports both cases. And I'll show you some examples of that in a second. So how do I use it? And so this is like, hopefully this is the magic where you, know, you can just, uh, use the open source package. We have a very permissive MIT license on it. It's on PyPy. You can just pip install MRF. There's actually an associated Docker image now, so if you want to just set up the uh, requirements that way, there's a, you know, the pip has the requirements as well. But 
the way we've written it is to have a scikit-learn interface as much as possible. You know, you instantiate an estimator by specifying um, there's two hyperparameters that you have to specify, the number of estimators and the number of EM iterations to run, run. and then you just call dot .fit on that with um, you, you have your training data both in X and in Z, and then you have an uh, array of um, cluster labels, like what cluster did that sample come from, and then of course the response variable, and you should see something like this coming out, which is uh, the, the EM iterations running. When you, um, and I'll, I'll get into what these Zs look like in a second, what X looks like, and there's different ways of doing it. But at a high level, this is what it looks like, as much as possible, uh, adhering to the scikit-learn interface. Uh, what, when you do train it, when you do fit it, uh, you can go back, and there's a bunch of um, uh, instance variables that are stored in the uh, MRF object that you can look at. So, for example, uh, one of the things we look at for, for training is the, the, what's called the generalized log likelihood. So this is like showing the algorithm converging. Um, as you can see, the, these are the different BIs for the different clusters. So in this case, I'm showing the BIs for seven different clusters. And as you can see, you know, it's converging eventually to some value for the different clusters. The uh, sigma E hat is converging, the sigma B uh, is converging. You know, after running this for 100 iterations, if I look at the different Bs where it converged to and I do a histogram, I see something that looks you know, Gaussian-ish and so this is, this is all showing that like the algorithm converged to a sane spot. Uh, I'm getting some sigma B and you can see and you can kind of match it up against this, these are the BIs that come out. So this is what training looks like. Uh, on the other side, when I go out to predict it, um, it's pretty simple. I just do dot predict and then I pass in uh, X, Z and uh, what cluster it came from. The package under the hood takes care of whether it came from uh, a known cluster or a new cluster. You as a user don't have to specify that. Internally, it's holding what cluster IDs it has seen. If it's seen it, it will do the correction. If it hasn't seen it, it will just use the default random forest prediction. So how does it do? So the, what I'm going to show you now, again, we're not, we don't need to get into the nitty gritty details of this, but th um, this is actually from the paper as well. We have implemented this as well. I'm gonna show you some results on synthetic data. Um, so long story short, this is the generative model for the synthetic data. We actually have um, in the open source package the uh, generator as an as a object that you can play with. What comes out is, um, it's, it's pretty easy. There's a response variable, why this will be regression. Um, it is a function of three variables, x0 through x2. These are, um, it's nonlinear function of those things. So as you can see, there's squares and, you know, relus and, um, you know, logs and absolute values. Uh, in addition, there is a, um, uh, uh, a random effect, a random bias that is added per cluster. So this is the generative model for the data. And the, and the goal is I want to make a model that predicts y as best as possible, um, you know, and so this is what the data looks like. The experiment that I'm going to show you the results for, um, I'm going to have 500 training samples distributed across 100 different clusters, very imbalanced clusters. 20 of those clusters only have one sample in them. Another 20 have three, and then so on and so forth. So there's different sized clusters. I'm going to test it on actually 9,500 samples, 5,000 of which are from brand new clusters that the algorithm has never seen, uh, also of different sizes. 4,500 samples are from the same 100 known clusters, and I have, again, like different amounts of data in each of those uh, clusters that I want to predict. So this is kind of the problem set up. What I'm gonna show you is what I call the, uh, like just the percentage gain that uh, the MRF has in mean squared error over the uh, algorithm that I'm gonna compare it to. Uh, and then I've averaged it over 10 runs. One more thing before I show you the results, there's two important knobs to this simulation. Uh, one is called the P-tab, which is I think called the, I forget what the P stands for, but it's like the total, um, it's the total variance that is predictable. Um, so it essentially comes down to 
how modelable is the problem? How much unmodelable noise is there? How much you know, exogenous noise is there in the system? So, the, so the, it's essentially SNR. So the, the more SNR in the syst th there is, the better a model can model this. The, the lower the SNR, no model can do well. It's just random Gaussian noise. You know, this, this last term, E, is higher and higher. So that is PTAV. And so that, that can vary between 0 all the way to, um, to, to 100. And then the other term is what I'm, it's called the random effects variability. And so this is really getting at how much of that total modelable variance is in the random effects term, is in the BI, versus in the, um, versus in the fixed effects part of it. And so that, again, is a number between 0 and 100. The higher that is, the more random effect there is in the system, the smaller it is, the less random effect there is in the system. So here's the results. So this is a lot to parse. I'll walk through it together. So what I'm showing here is two plots. One is showing it for the known clusters, and one is showing it for the new clusters. What I'm plotting here on the y-axis is the gain that MRF had over the compared algorithm. And then the um, blue curves are for when the PTAV is 90, so it's very, very high SNR, it's very, very modelable. Uh, this red curves are for PTAV equals 60, so there's much more unmodeled noise in the system. So let's w see what this means. Let's look at this point right here. The, uh, the squares refer to, um, I'm comparing MRF versus a global random forest, and the triangles, I'm comparing MRF versus um, a random forest where I have one hot encoded the 100 clusters. So what is, what is, let's look at this point right here, which is the best point. So I'm definitely going to show you that. Um, it's, what I'm seeing here is that in a random, comparing MRF to a random forest on the test data, I see almost a 70% gain in performance uh, when the PREV is 50, which is, you know, like there's, there's a pretty strong random effects component to this. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the PTAV is 90, so there's, you know, there's high SNR, there's a lot of modelability. The gain isn't as high when I do the random forest one hot encoding, but it's still, you know, like it's like 55%. So as you can see, if you thought that one hot encoding was going to do well, it's not. The random forest gets lost. The mixed effects is a much better way to incorporate this cluster specific information. And same thing here, the, the effect is less uh, if the PTAV is lower because there's just like less modelable, um, uh, like there's, le le there's more noise in the system, there's just less modelable. So no matter what, you're not going to get as uh, good results. It kind of is like the, it's the normalizer. And as the random effect increases, you get um, more gain from MRF. So this is interesting. This is for known clusters. On the right, I'm showing it for new clusters. And as you can see, this doesn't look great, but that's like I never expected MRF to do well here. I've never seen data from these clusters. So what's important here is did I cause no harm? And so that seems to be the case. I'm, I'm like right, hovering right around zero. So, you know, for data from clusters that I have never seen, I'm not hurting it. I'm, I'm doing just as well as if I trained a global model. So that's kind of the takeaway here. And you know, there's, there's some noise here. I've only run it for 100 runs. I should have run it for 10,000, 100,000 runs. But I think asymptotically, this should converge to zero. So this is kind of like, this is where MRF is useful. And so I can't show uh, the client results because uh, of NDA things. But we've actually used this on a number of client projects, um, one in the energy space, one in the healthcare space, learning idiosyncratic models for you know, patients and for particular um, buildings. Um, in addition, we've actually, um, since we've open sourced it, I think we've open sourced it for about maybe almost a year now, but like, yeah, like, let's say like 10 months, something like that. We've actually had a lot of collaborations, people emailing us to collaborate on stuff. There's a sleep study out of Harvard, an MRI imaging study out of UCSF that have used this package to do the model, modeling. Um, and um, another thing that we're starting to work on, just to kind of showcase it on some real data, the paper has it on this particular movie data set, uh, how it has really uh, good benefits. I'm actually, uh, I started doing this yesterday night. Um, not the best time to crack open a new data set, but I did it on the Rossman Kaggle data set, which is a data set where I'm trying to predict the sales 
uh, of different stores. And here the cluster is the different store, but I want to learn, you know, like I want to learn both a global, global model across all stores in addition to idiosyncratic things per store. And so there it seems to be on like a preliminary kind of run. It seems to be doing like about 30% better uh, if I do um, MRF. And, and I just use MRF with a very, very simple um, uh, random effects covariate. I'm only allowing the, the bias to be different per cluster. In more complicated formulations, I could put in other features in, in the random effect as well. So definitely showing a lot of promise on this data set. Um, so yeah, if you guys are interested, there's a bunch of Jupyter notebooks checked in to the repo, you know, like uh, the, we could show you how to use it and look at different things in it. The Minnesota data set is there, you know, how to, do, you know, running the synthetic uh, data and seeing those MRF gain plots. All of that is checked in, open sourced. You can take a look at it. Um, and really this is now like the part where I'm, I want to, hopefully you guys have like know like about a little bit about mixed effects random forest and where it can be useful. And, you know, please, if you have a problem, please use it. If you can share with the community, please like share your results, share the data set if you can. And uh, we'd love to hear about it. The main thing though is that there is a lot of work still to be done here. You know, there's a lot of open GitHub issues. Um, there's a lot of extensions that we want to do. We want to, what's nice about MRF, it's actually, the random forest part, the mixed effects random forest part, it's actually, um, it's actually a misnomer because this general principle works with any nonlinear function. So we could do mixed effects gradient boosting. We could do mixed effects deep learning. All of that is actually possible. And so we want to do some extensions around that. Right now it only works for regression. There is a natural extension to make it work for classification problems. Um, I want to make it more like PyTorch and Keras where you can pass in a validation set so it's automatically figuring out how many iterations to run it for because the, it, the number of iterations, if you run it for too long, you could potentially overfit. So I, there's a lot of work to be done there. There's some newer validation strategies that I want to implement. So this is um, stuff that we've done for some of our clients, but nested cross-validation and mixed effects nested cross-validation are some um, kind of unique validation strategies that we can uh, leverage for this type of clustered data. Uh, in addition, I think there's some interesting novel research to be done for doing, um, for making that mixed effect non-linear. And so a lot of work to be done. And so really, you know, like I want to put this out to the community. If you find this useful, if you want to pick one of those GitHub issues, if you want to work on some of these, please reach out, you know, and give us a pull request. We'll like, you know, we, we'll, we'll merge it in there. You know, we, um, I'm, I'm the CTO of Manifold, and we have other people working on it right now, but it's, we're very busy, and so it's hard to find time uh, other than if it's, you know, on, on paid engagements to develop this. So, yeah, that's, uh, hopefully you've learned a little bit about mixed effects modeling and when it can be useful and mixed effects random forests. Um, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, open for any and all questions. Raise your hand. Uh, I'm curious how you um, set the initial conditions, initial values for both the nonlinear portion and the linear mixed effects part, and whether the algorithm as a whole is robust to um, randomized versus homogeneous initial values? Yeah, that's a good, good question. I, I haven't specifically explored that in detail. I, I picked what the, what the paper did, which is just BIs are all set to zero, and then the, the random forest is the first thing that's, that's trained so that there's no initial conditions for the random forest. Um, and so that, that's how it's done uh, right now. So, you know, I, I, I could imagine that that could be an issue, um, but so far, so good. On, on most problems, it seems pretty well behaved. That being said, just to add a little bit to your question, this can still diverge. There are configurations of the data, particularly if you don't have very much data, that this, this algorithm could diverge. And perhaps in those scenarios, maybe initial conditions could matter. But if you have enough data, it seems like pretty robust to um, not diverging.
Hello. Um, so it seems like the clusters were already inherent in the data set. Have you had any su success with um, maybe doing us unsupervised clustering and having those par be part of the input for the, the random effect? Have you seen any success with that? You know, I personally, we have not run it that way. That's actually a fantastic idea, like, you know, do segmentation or clustering beforehand and pass that in uh, as a cluster. Most of the problems that we've worked on, there's a natural clustering and the data is known. So, for example, in this energy problem, I was trying to model uh, the kind of the thermal model of buildings, and I have which building it's from. I have historical data from buildings. For the, for the healthcare data, I have, you know, I know which patient it is. So it was already in the data. But that, that's actually a really interesting um, uh, idea that you have there. I, I, I could see that, that having promise. Cool. Maybe in the back first. Uh, this was really cool. I, um, I had a question about the example that you gave, or actually a question about random forests, about the example you gave where you've got sort of like a student level cluster and then you've got maybe a teacher level cluster. Um, so so wh which one was it? Sorry. I you, were, you were giving an example um, where you might have clusters at different levels or you yeah. might have like a feature that's high cardinality and then another feature which is, you know, superset of that that's low cardinality. And that's something I've never really understood about random forests, so I wanted to hear if you had any thoughts. Like, um, why would the random forest ever pick the low cardinality feature? It seems like it doesn't have any penalty for just going straight for the highest cardinality feature there is. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, and th this is, I'm not an expert on this, but like the intuition that I have from some of the, some of the literature out there, why does the random forest get lost? Because it's trying to split maximizing like Gini impurity or you know, you know, MSC delta per stage. And when you have the high cardinality uh, one hot encoded vector, it's like no split on those like passes muster, right? And really like the right way to split high cardinality variables is you look at power sets. Like you're like, okay, one, three, seven versus two and five. Is that the right split to have? And that's the right way to do it, but like scikit-learn doesn't do that, right? And so you one-hot encode, and then it often never splits on those one-hot encoded variables because no, no given one passes muster. Um, and so that, that's why the random forest, quote-unquote, won't split on the high cardinality variables. And so oftentimes, yeah, people do kind of bucketing of those high cardinality variables. I think the argument here is that using a more using an approach like mixed effects modeling that is much more naturally in tune with this clustering could be better. There's a question up here as well. Uh, how does the, the algorithm handle nested clusters? What, what like clusters? Nested. I, you know, I don't think it handles it right now, as it is. Um, I, I, I have to, again, I think this is probably a question for the professors at HEC Montreal. I, I think it, it could be extended to do so. I think that, that that's natural. I think essentially in that big iteration cycle, you would have additional iterations, right, in the, in the training stage. Um, that being said, maybe there's some, I know there's like the idea of crossed clusters and non-crossed clusters. So I think there's some, care that needs to be taken, but I don't, I don't foresee that like being a blocker. I think the, this EM framework can handle that. As it stands, it probably um, doesn't, but if you want to make a pull request, you should. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question up here at this table as well. I think you sort of answered that when you mentioned the example of um, uh, the, the, the number of buildings that you coded as random variable, but in practice, what was the cardinality, the maximum cardinality of the random variable? Of what, in uh, something, a client project or? Uh, in practice, how many, how many levels of that uh, categorical variables have you seen where it still worked okay? I mean, some of those things had thousands of categories, like thousands of clusters, and it just, I mean, this is the beauty of it. Like, that's like, one hot encoding is totally not gonna work with a thousand different clusters. Uh, this is particularly on the healthcare data I'm talking about. We had thousands of patients in this, in this particular thing that we're trying to model, but the, this thing worked. 
um, you know, I, it's, um, it gets slower and slower as that scales out. But I think, again, another extension that can be made is like it is some things are parallelizable here that are not parallelized. Um, that, that could happen as well. But yeah, I think you would probably break the, the single, single computer compute first before algorithmically failing. Question here or no? Oh. Cool. Um, so uh, how scalable is this, um, like going back to the previous um, question, like do you see maybe an extension for Spark in the future? Do you see that coming? That, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, like, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anything intrinsically blocking that other than, you know, people's time and the developer community's time. So I could, it could definitely happen. Right now, I mean, I think, Again, our contribution was there wasn't even an open source implementation. It was just in a paper. So we made the Python package. I think, I think this is step one, but you know, I can imagine you know, like making Spark connectors, Dask, and all sorts of stuff that, that, that could happen. Um, yeah? Have you com uh, compared the result with something like Catboost? Yes, yes. I think uh, like, uh, like the... That's another thing we've done as well. Yeah, like Cat Boost, Light GBM, uh, XG Boost, same same issues. Like if you even Cat Boost fails when you have like a really really high cardinality um, uh, categorical variables. You know, though it does more intrinsically deal with it. It it does it doesn't it doesn't scale out. Fundamentally, it's an exponential growth of the power sets you have to look at. Thanks, guys. Well, let's thank Dr. J one more time.